Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 419. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's July 13th, 2018. You know, I'm not normally superstitious, being Friday the 13th at all. Well, actually, Ash Wednesday kind of makes me superstitious, but uh, uh, not in general. How was your week, George? Ah, it's been dreadful. I've been uh, watching General Convention, which is always depressing. Yeah, it's but it's entertaining as well. It's like it's like watching really bad science fiction movies. You know, it's you know, you think this is not art, but it's so entertainingly it, bad. It, are, it, it is art. You know, when the flame comes out of the bottom of the rocket, because they're filming it wrong, the flame kind of wants to go up. Yeah, I, I've seen that uh, so many times from General Convention. Flying the rocket the wrong way. Before we get too far, let's uh, get people to like the episode, subscribe to the episode, uh, comment on the episode when it's up. Now, yeah, it's what am I saying? It's up because you're watching it, and share the episode. Uh, a lot of the likes have uh, just taken off since we've uh, been asking you to do it. And we really appreciate that. Other news: we are going to be putting out a podcast. For those who, for the last five years, have demanded that we do podcasting, um, we have a church uh, who's going to get you know uh, a brought to you by uh, disclaimer who's going to sponsor and pay for the podcast, uh, the hosting, and the delivery of that. Uh, that will start next week, but I'll probably try and get this one up this week, and we'll see what happens. George, you mentioned General Convention. Um, it happens once every three years for the Episcopal Church. For the first time in almost a generation, I'm seeing the liberals are not loud enough to make the House of Bishops do what they want it to do. I, I, am I? Is that what you saw? Well, we've been fortunate. There have been a lot of deaths. It's been a very bad flu season, and the nasty, doctrinaire, mean people aren't there anymore. The Charles Bennisons, the John Brunos, the Jack Spongs, the uh, go on, we spend the rest of the next <laughs> half hour doing this. That's a, there's a lot of list of 60 we could just go through. And, and what's happened is that there's a younger generation of bishops who, many of whom, the majority of whom, share the progressive values. Like, let's take the Bishop of Washington. She's a card-carrying liberal. Every time a, a gay initiative will come forward, she'll back it. But at the same time, she's going, oh, my God, the church is going over the cliff. we got to do something. And so this group is willing to find a way forward and accommodation to basically keep in the Episcopal Church that one section that's growing, that's healthy, that has cash in the bank. And it's not the it's case. Not, it's not the liberal church. Well, going into convention, the biggest worry was uh, probably three things. Let's talk about the prayer book. Let's talk about uh, the uh, imposition of uh, same-sex marriage upon bishops who do not wish it, and some other changes, uh, gender changes. So let's address the first one. It looks like the 1979 uh, uh, prayer book is here to stay. Yes. That, that was handed down by Charlton Heston at Sinai and it, uh, or Moses. So. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the big push was a move to change the Book of Common Prayer, which includes the catechism and the marriage ceremony, to make it gender neutral, to, to uh, conform to the beliefs of, uh, of a new group, which is that marriage is not between a man and a woman, but between any old a man and a fine cigar, yes. two men. It's a cat and a dog, you know, whatever you want to call it. Marriage and by affection, there, <laughs> yes. And there was a great deal of noise and push how this is going to achieve, but, and the deputies passed it. And there was a rear guard action in the House of Deputies. Um, my diocese, Central Florida, fought very hard, as well as other dioceses. Uh, I have an uh, honorary retired assistant. Uh, on my staff here, who is actually a deputy from the Diocese of Florida, mm -hmm. which is about 15 miles, next county north. We're right in the border area. So he registered, registered there, works here. He fought very hard to have any changes put to the Book of Occasional Services or kept in supplemental liturgical rites. Uh -huh. Now, why is that? Well, the reality is that people are going to do what they're going to do. 
And so you're going to have people using gay liturgies, going to change Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to sustainer, redeemer, creator, all this nonsense. But if you change the prayer book, then you're making, then you're giving the successful, growing, optimistic portion of the church the question, are you a member of this same faith? Because I don't believe in a sustainer, redeemer, creator. I believe that's modalism. It's an old heresy. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the bishops, you know, shot all these changes down and finally said, look, we're going to keep the prayer book as it is. So Dan Martin doesn't have to leave. Greg Brewer doesn't have to leave. All the uh, dozen or so conservative outspoken bishops will be able to stay put. Now, they did give something to the liberals, though. They said that a liberal congregation can ask for depot from a conservative bishop. But they did it in such a way that I don't see how it's actually going to work. No, because the, they didn't do it, it to match the canons. Uh, it, as we've learned from the Episcopal Church in the last 60 years, canons are the law, are the canons, are what we believe. Mm -hmm. And early on in, in the, uh, the, the Episcopal Church's General Convention in Austin, we saw uh, kind of the old-time politics start with uh, how they treated Honduras. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I still believe there's that, that imagination there, those people who really think that they can work the old way, but in the end, it just didn't work, George. Yeah, I mean, the, the, current, pl the current plan is that, as I've read it, the a vestry would ask their priest, who would then ask their bishop, and the bishop, if he's opposed, would, would then have to pass that request on to another bishop of his choosing to exercise temporary pastoral oversight for that marriage. So that parish... However... However, it also reinforced the rights of the rector to refuse, mm -hmm. and the vestry to refuse if the rector wants to do it, and it doesn't say how this works. And it's also, they haven't changed any of the other canons about canonical obedience to a bishop. So let's take an extreme. We, in my diocese, I forget how many parishes we have, 95, 100. We've got only one parish that's talking about this. Now, if the bishop went to the priest and say, I give you a pastoral directive, don't ask me. And she says, Okay, and the vestry says, ask. She says, I can't. I can. yeah. You don't go ahead. Or she says, well, I'm going to go anyway and be a martyr and burn to the stake. Well, that's nice. She's then deposed for violating a pastoral directive. Um, and, there's, and there's no way you can hit back at that because it's not bound by the bishop, but by the clergy who bring charges against her in the diocesan clergy court. It's not the bishop who is the bad guy. It's those cranky old men up in North Florida. Um, my point is that this was done on the fly, and it looked it looks like some of the auto repair jobs I did when I was a young man, you know, where you got a few extra nuts and bolts and screws <laughs> left over, and you just don't don't stop, mom, don't stop, just keep going because the engine will fall out if you're uh, if you stop too quickly. It's it's a mess. No, but here's the wonderful thing: a mess is a good thing. <laughs> Because it doesn't change anything. Well, I think you know the Episcopal's desire to still be you know all heresies to all men exist at many different levels, but at some point the bishops have figured out we're shrinking and there's just no way back unless we stop the hemorrhaging right now, right here. We're not changing the prayer book. We're not changing God's gender. If we could, um, we have to stop this. Well. I'll give you an example. I think it was yesterday, Thursday, the House of Deputies talked about liturgical reform, revising Eucharistic prayers in right to Holy Communion, revising Eucharistic prayer B. And they wanted to drop the phrase Son of God. Jesus would no longer be the Son of God. He'd be the child of God. Now, the people supporting this change felt that it was offensive to their feminine sensibilities, and some of these were men, I guess, too, uh, that Jesus would be identified as a man. Well, others stepped up from the middle. Not just the faithful three or four conservatives, but the middle said, 
I'm afraid Jesus was a man. <laughs> this is and, you know, he said, you know, the please. Bible says, you know, <laughs> this is how I tell you to pray. Abba, Father, you know, the Lord's man. And so that was defeated. There was another move to have the word Israel. There's a small group of people who are rabidly anti-Semitic in the Episcopal Church. They I don't call know how that small people. that is, but okay. Well, it's small because they all show up at general convention, but in the rest of the world, they don't. Okay, all right. So the anti the Jew haters wanted to re remove Israel from uh, the Eucharistic prayer be and call it our ancestors, mm -hmm. removing the link and the connection to, to the people of Israel. That again uh, went nowhere, but it took a considerable amount of time. And then the you know by the time it got to the bishops, phew, we're not doing this. So what they finally came up with is we will permit, we will agree to spend $200,000 instead of $2 million, which was a new prayer book would have cost. We'll spend $200,000 to study and prepare these additional supplemental rites that you can use in your church of three people on the Lower East Side of Manhattan or in San Francisco. And then guess what they did? They didn't allocate any money. No, they didn't. I mean, basically, so, this has to happen for free and with volunteers. But then it doesn't count. It did not. I mean, it doesn't count because it's not officially funded. So yes, I'm sure they're 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 liturgy kooks. Uh, um, well, this is not the time for liturgy jokes, but uh, liturgists are the nastiest form of human beings you'll ever meet. <laughs> <Story. laughs> Liturgy types will spend the rest of their days parsing how to uh, do a gender inclusive, Israel free. Uh, so you're saying there's liturgy Nazis out there? Is that what you're saying? Because I I know I know some grammar Nazis. They actually email me quite frequently. Um, now there's liturgy but the thing Nazis. Is they, can, they can do this, uh, you know, antiquarian research that they'd love to do, but it doesn't matter because it's not being funded by the national church. So, at the, at, but at the end of the day, you're going to have. We're leaving things as they are. I'm never going to be compelled to do anything that is contrary to God's word revealed, and as laid down in the Book of Common Prayer. That that has been nailed down. Well, I think and that's. If you want to call God, you know, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Manny Mo Jack, you're free to do so. Don't do it in Central Florida, but you're still free to do it. Well, I think we can start passing out the T-shirts now. The T-shirt says, "I survived GC '79." Um, well, we obviously, really Jeff should. Walton. We really, you we know, really need to give Jeff Walton a wonderful Je gift. Jeff Walton deserves one. Yeah, you know, the reality is, we went in here, um, and the worst that could have happened didn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. The best that could have happened, the repentance and return to the fold of the Anglican Communion, that didn't happen either. Um, but we're we're stuck kind of in in the minutia. The Susan Russells of the world and all those will still operate in the dark of night. Um, they, what they do without the official permission of the Episcopal Church will still continue to happen, George. But I think we also need to realize that those people were never going to change. Mm -hmm. They were going to do what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to force us to say, that's nice. They wanted our, they wanted my approval as well, a They wanted your Episcopal. approval and affirmation. Yes, yeah. and you know, um, they tried to get that by dictate. Mm -hmm. They tried to command respect and trust, mm -hmm. and you can't do that. No. But okay. they've been given the space to continue to be kooks. Let's now, talk about well. Before, well, let me just can get finish up. That's right. Because there, I mean, there's one lots of kooky stuff. I mean, we can do uh, there, yes. just exciting kooky stuff. Uh, we had the traditional move to any, move to denigrate Israel, to denounce Israel for mm -hmm. the boy, boycott, disinvestment, sanctions. Uh, you get all these. Uh, where these people come from, I don't know. Uh, who want to punish Israel? And it's basically this. During the 1930s, the Germans, the Nazis, had a campaign: "Don't buy Jewish." And you remember. Yep. Remember the little pictures of the uh, SA stormtroopers standing in front of a Jewish shop and a swastika? Yep. And what, they'd break the windows, they would steal the merchandise, yes. Well, there's a faction within the Episcopal Church that are basically modern-day stormtroopers. Mm -hmm. uh, they they want to paint swastika, they want to paint uh, Stars of David and swastikas 
on Israel and say, don't buy Israel. Well, the House of Bishops, so that passed the House of Deputies. But the bishops, the grown-ups in the room, uh, basically by an overwhelming majority, rejected it. Yeah. Let, let me give you some vignettes, I think, that sort of, in my mind, encapsulate the change. And this is purely subjective. Sam Candler, lovely man, wonderful man, uh, wears a bow tie, and I have an urge to call him Poindexter, but that's a different story. Uh, he chairman, of, he's dean of Atlanta, St. Philip's Cathedral, prestigious church. Candler, yes, he's related to the Coca-Cola fortune. Don't know whether that has anything to do with it, but Sam was head of the committee on the prayer book, and at some of these press conferences and statements, Sam said, by changing the liturgy, we are changing how we understand and experience God, which is true. And the changes he wanted to do was gender-free language, changing the understanding of doctrine of marriage, and all this and that. Now, 10 years ago, the uh, Diocese of Atlanta's bishop would have been all over this. Well, they have a liberal bishop, Philip Wright. He's an African-American. He said he ran again. He and Candler were in opposition for election to be bishop. Bishop Wright gets up in the House of Bishops and says, I just don't hear a groundswell of, of opinion. People telling me that they want new prayer books. I just don't hear it. And then the Bishop of Texas got up, uh, and he's, I, I shouldn't denigrate people, but the Bishop of Texas, who is not like the old Bishop of Texas, uh, got up and said, you know, it'd be nice if we spent $2 million to have all these shiny new prayer books, but what good is it if there's nobody in the building? Mm -hmm. and, and this is the Bishop of Texas, and this man, he's, well, he's the sort of guy who always is in the majority, no matter how the vote turns out. Uh, he's in the majority. So there's a, a swing taking place within the House of Bishops where the liberal winds are still blowing in deputies, and but the bishops who actually have the real responsibility for the life of the church, it's called the Episcopal Church, are basically saying, look, we got to pull out of this nosedive that we're in, and we have to live and let live. And that goes back to the point, they're not, you know, the liberals are not loud enough anymore. Back in when I went to Columbus and Minnesota, Minneapolis, they were really loud, George. And it's not that they lost their voice, but they've won. They lost the fight. And, you know, those troopers and generals and sergeants that used to be part of this liberal voice aren't there anymore. You know. I mean, there must have been a bad flu season this past winter. <laughs> yes. um, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, a win for uh, General Convention for some liberals, and that's the money allocated to uh, the office of uh, Gay Clark Jennings. Yes, they voted to fund the office of the President of the House of Deputies. Mm -hmm. And they're being sneaky as well, because they're calling her and the presiding Bishop Michael Curry the presiding officers of the Episcopal Church. Now, if you look at the canons, That's not there. the House of Deputies job president really can be filled part-time, if that. Mm -hmm. But in the last 10 years, the bureaucracy, there's been bureaucratic creep. And she flies everywhere, and she gives these speeches, and she does all these things that are not, uh, that responsibility is not given to her in the canon and constitution, but it's been assumed. But and she, now she's given a, a salary and a bigger staff. She, and the she, bishops are starting... Go ahead. No, okay. She represents the last 40 years of the liberal wing inside the Episcopal Church that has brought the House of Deputies to become kind of the UN. This is the oh, United absolutely. Nations of the Episcopal Church. And the only way they can sustain this is to give money to that department, George. Well, here's the joke of it. The, uh, the money's not there anymore. There's no money. And so just so it'll be interesting to see how much they fund the presiding bishop's salary to be mm -hmm. and whether the bishops are going to wake up and say, hey, wait a second, who does this person think she is by trying to claim equal authority as Michael Curry? I mean, I've already said this once in this show, but we are an Episcopal church, not a, uh, a Presbyterian church. So the House of Deputies... You know, there's, and maybe I as a low churchman should be happy about this, but there's been a strong Presbyterian push out of the House of Deputies that the bishops have resisted. 
And Michael Curry is leading, has chosen a new way forward, which I think uh, he's chosen the New Zealand plan um, as the way forward for the Episcopal Church. Let's talk a little bit now before we finish up here. I'm looking at the time. We're, what, 20 minutes in? Sorry, people. It's going a little long, but this is what we get to talk about, the Episcopal Church. I mean, how many people have I slandered today? So. <laughs> I know. Just, yeah, all opinions are George's, not mine. Okay, let's move on to the ca calendar visions. I noticed that you, I, and Gavin finally have a day uh every friday the 13th is called uh, unscripted day uh but there's no money there's no people i didn't see any decisions finalized on this calendar revisions are doing <laughs> oh this is wonderful the episcopal church has a book called book of occasional services and lesser feasts and fast they're mm -hmm. the ones that you find in the in the sacristy that uh the, the acolytes are scribbled in when they were bored in the sermon you never use it nope they list, you know, you know, Gavin is an Anglo, is a Catholic eat sort of guy, and he'll open up by saying, today is the feast day of uh, St. Swithin. And, uh, you know, that's, where do you find that? You'll find that in Lesser Feasts and Fasts. Well, the Episcopal Church discontinued Lesser Feasts and Fasts and put out a uh, uh, holy men, holy women and men, and we've got all these different unofficial, semi-official books, and the there was a whole day, half day wasted of debating who should be in and who should be out of this combined book of lesser feasts and fasts. And essentially, in other words, there's the, the call for the first lesbian in a wheelchair uh, priest to be named the same to the church, you know, things like that. And then at the same time, oh, C.S. Lewis has got to be in there, and <laughs> and then we have the Kevin and George. Three, we got to put Kevin and George. We in got there. the two or three Catholics who want somebody that you know nobody has ever heard of. Of course, we need to have Saint Dominicus of Pereira in there. Uh, well, so what happened? They came to all this, and they finally voted to do this. But guess what they admitted to do? Pay for it. Pay for it. And name, say who's going to be in it. That's right. Say who's going to be in it. So we have a new book of occasional ser lesser feasts and fasts, but we don't know who's actually going to be in it. It's like Congress. I can't tell you what's in the bill until unless you vote for it and we pass it. It's you know, Greg Brewer had a line. Uh, do watch Greg Brewer, Bishop Brewer of Central Florida on Anglican Inc. We posted his daily video commentaries, and one of the Bishop Brewer's commentaries from the show we posted uh, this morning is that. There can be no worse way of prayer book revision than having an 800-member chamber debate and offer opinions and resolutions and amendments. And this whole, but Kevin, I would take that and I would apply it to the whole of the House of Deputies and General Convention. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. But look, at the Diocese of Northern Michigan has one deputy for every 125 members, active members in church on Sunday. One per every 125. So my parish would actually have t two deputies to general convention if we were in northern Michigan. In Texas, which has got 100,000 people in church, they've got the same number as northern Michigan. And how, tell me, how is that equitable? It's not. There's one bishop of Texas and two or three suffragans. There's one bishop of northern Michigan. Mm -hmm. And well, that's why, you know, sometime in the 1930s and 40s, they said, we just need to push liberals into these uh, deputy uh, positions and uh, get our changes in. I mean, it was nice and slow. It worked fine. They now run your church for a while. We'll have to see if there's any grace and glory for the moderates and conservatives to return to the Episcopal Church. I'm not sure. I, I, I do want to tell about the New Zealand plan, Kevin. New Zealand plan? Tell me about New Zealand and tell me about Trump and we will finish up here in about four Three minutes. Go, quick, come on, come on, come on, go, go, go. Well, it's, I'm thinking of that Monty Python episode, summarizing Proust in 90 <laughs> seconds. Right. Uh, okay. The presiding bishop has put, has put forward a bipartisan a, uh, bill, if you will, to form a committee evenly balanced of those in favor of the changes, those opposed to the changes, in order to find a way that the church can live and work together. This is what they did in New Zealand. Richard Elena friend of this show, Bishop of Nelson, longtime GAFCON stalwart, was in charge, and the New Zealand church came up with a agree to disagree 
I leave you alone, you leave me alone, way forward. And we'll still be in the same church, but in essence, we're in the different different unions in the a, same a industry. A different type of dual integrity. Different, more dual integrities. Yes. Curry is looking to adopt that approach to the Episcopal Church. Now, what does this mean? It means no more lawsuits. Mm -hmm. It means no more vilifications. It means no more depositions. Uh, the Catherine Jeffrey Shorey days have well and truly ended. At the same time, for those who want the purity of a church that stands for something real and it has integrity, well, you're not going to get it here, folks. Now, what I, I, I see the Trump effect at work in the Episcopal Church. No, we don't all have orange hair now. <laughs> the Trump effect. You know, well, Trump based on in, uh, Twitter accounts I read from the Episcopal Church, I think you're right on. Yeah. <laughs> what's the Trump effect? Um, Trump, there's 10 or 12 different Donald Trumps. He speaks to his audience so that an audience in front of a rally, thats he's an entertainer. In a professional business meeting, he's as hard-nosed and strong as they absolutely. come. Absolutely, he changes part of language. Trump's yeah. part of Trump's success, you know, is his ability to move, pivot, and basically work with the crowd in front of him. Trump was, at, you know, there's been another murder in in England where the K, FSB or the successor to the KGB has murdered some more Russian emigres or mm -hmm. something like that. And Trump was in London, and he was asked, is he going to do anything about these continuing Russian murders? And he said, well, I don't know what's going on here, but, and I not a, don't know Putin well enough to call him a friend, but I think he's somebody we can work with. And he used the word, Russia is no longer our, he didn't say it in this he phrase, didn't say but no longer. Russia is no longer our enemy, they're our competitor. Mm -hmm. So Trump has completely changed the dynamics of international relations and he's approaching Putin as a competitor rather than an enemy who is out to destroy him. Now why is that important? Because if you look at someone as a competitor, you don't automatically vilify them, hate them, seek to destroy them. You look, you know, we have a better product and we want to have more sales than you, but we acknowledge you some we we give you some sort of recognition. That approach of not enemies but competitors I see arising within the House of Bishops in the Episcopal Church. They're competing visions at work here. They're not necessarily I mean I have been to in my 20 my first church convention was the Diocese of Pennsylvania collect, uh, convention to elect Charles Benison that wound up electing Charles Benison mm -hmm. as Bishop of Pennsylvania. I saw local members of Integrity, as was then called, uh, spit on my rector, uh, Dan Sullivan, after wow. Dan got up and said that uh, he did not think that this that uh, homosexual relations were in God's plan. Mm -hmm. And this de and this deputy got up and he walked over to Dan as Dan was in, at the microphone and he spat in his face and said, "I have AIDS and I hope you die." That is the Episcopal Church of 1993 to 2016 that I've experienced all my life. Those people are gone, or they're leaving, or they're moving out of the thing. Mm -hmm. So we don't we don't have the viciousness and the nastiness. Yes, we've mentioned a few nasty people who are still around, but the culture that and here's the thing: at that 1993 meeting. The Bishop of Pennsylvania, Alan Bartlett, did nothing. Yeah. Did nothing to reprimand the man. Uh, do you remember, you know, at that time, AIDS, we didn't know where it came from, how you got it, and if you spat in somebody's face and you had AIDS, you could very well give them AIDS. Sure. That we that we didn't have, know any better. That's the old that's the Episcopal Church in which I have been formed. And that we're not there anymore. Thanks be to God. We got to talk about Trump. Who is now over in Europe, you know, causing uh, uh, just a tenacious headache. But he's not the topic of unscripted. Anglicans are. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you have been watching what's today's date? <laughs> Four nineteen. Go for it. Four nineteen. <laughs> now it's the episode, not the day. That's it's right. the today's July third. <laughs> okay, friends, you know how the show ends. Yeah, okay. Just take it on trust. Four nineteen, July thirteenth. 
You can't, it's Friday. We're not supposed to be doing our best job on Friday. We sur we survived GC seven uh yeah, seventy nine.